Welcome to Public Health IT. This will be a lecture on epidemiological databases and registries. This is Lecture B. The learning objectives for the Epidemiological Databases and Registries Unit are Number 1. Identify the functions and key issues of epidemiology compared to clinical practice. Number 2. Define and distinguish among the components that make up epidemiology. Number 3. Identify the difference between environmental and mechanistic causes of diseases. Number 4. Describe the components of epidemiological reasoning. Number 5. List the different types of epidemiology. Number 6. Define clinical epidemiology and its relationship with evidence-based practice. Number 7. Explain the current applications of epidemiology and how the results influence evidence-based practice. Number 8. Identify different sources of epidemiological databases and how information is updated and exchanged with clinical entities. Number 9. Describe the purpose of a registry, the types of information contained within public health registries, and how this information can be used. Number 10. Identify the defining characteristics of epidemiological registries. Number 11. Identify different entities that operate registries and how information from clinical practice gets imported into these registries. And 12. Identify security and access issues in the information exchange between communities, clinical institutions, public health departments, and federal agencies involved in public health prevention and control. This list provides a good set of the many accessible tools that are available right now that can be used in research on disease, the cause of disease, and the frequency of disease within communities. We begin with several data sources maintained by the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health. As we continue in the list, we can see that some data sources contain information on exposure to contaminants such as the tools provided by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Here is a set of data sources provided by different types of organizations, the National Cancer Institute, the U.S. Census Bureau, the American College of Surgeons, and the University of California in Berkeley all maintain their own epidemiological databases. There are many more epidemiological databases and registries available online. You should be familiar with how the information in these epidemiological databases and registries is updated and exchanged with clinical health institutions. In order to do so, please go to the websites and review the sites. For each of the links listed in this list, Please identify how the information gets updated. For example, how often is patient information updated for a data source? Is the information updated on a weekly, monthly, or yearly basis? What is the original source of the data that is getting input into the database or registry? Also, please determine how the information is obtained by the public and the format of the output. Imagine yourself as a staff member within a public health agency and you need statistics on a specific disease. As a staff member working within a public health agency, determine how you would obtain information from each data source. For example, in what format would data get output? In Excel, Word, and another format that you are not familiar with possibly? How would you download the data that gets output? And is there a privacy or security agreement that you need to sign? Also, here are two freely available software applications that can be used in epidemiological research. Please review these and determine one or two examples of how you could use the software tools for an epidemiological application. Here we can see the home page for an epidemiological database containing information on nationwide cancer data, the National Cancer Database. 
This website provides an explanation for the purpose of the National Cancer Database, as well as providing information on what kind of data is collected. Additionally, we can see on the left-hand side of the home page additional links to other sections of the website. We need to determine if there is a way for us to access the data. Figuring out what information is accessible can sometimes be confusing. We're going to use this website to not only demonstrate the type of information tools that are accessible online, but also demonstrate that we as consumers of this type of information in public health, we may need to investigate or drill down on various links on the website in order to actually find what we are looking for. As we scroll down on the homepage for NCDB, we can see that the website includes links to specific applications that have been developed to provide access to the data within the National Cancer Database. One of the links listed includes NCDB Survival Reports. We could assume that by clicking on the link for NCDB Survival Reports, that will then be shown the web page providing further information. However, most of these sites can be confusing to navigate. If we do click on that link, we'll actually be transported to a login screen. We can see from this web page that we need a user ID and password. But at this point, we're just trying to get acquainted with the National Cancer Database, and we simply want to find out more information on those survival reports. So we need to go back to the other web page and click on the other links provided in order to figure out what these survival reports are. If we click on the link on the previous page that was called Web-Based Data Applications, we'll be presented with more detail on all of the applications that have been developed for the NCDB, including the NCDB Survival Reports. Now that we've found additional data on the website for the NCDB Survival Reports, we can now determine what options we have in accessing information on cancer survival statistics, as well as what types of file formats we can choose from to view the resulting report. For these reports, from this paragraph on the web page, we can see that the data is provided in Adobe Acrobat PDF format, as well as Microsoft Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. We can also see that we could filter data by the geographical location of the cancer program in which the data was collected, as well as the diagnosis time frame. Also, we see that there is a limitation to the time period in which patient cases were collected, 1994 to 1997 and 1998 to 2001. If we wanted even more detail on what we can do with these reports, we could click on the User Guide link that will then display a PDF. Remember the login screen that we saw when we initially tried to get more detail on the NCDB survival reports? Well, now that we have more information on NCDB survival reports, we want to determine how to get access to the data to be able to generate a report. If we look through the website and find the link on how to access NCDB data links, we'll find further details on how to get access. It's not so simple because the website indicates that only certain types of personnel can gain access, specifically staff involved with cancer programs that are affiliated with the agency that collects the data within the National Cancer Database. So if you're a member of the staff involved with cancer programs affiliated with the Commission on Cancer, then you can access this data. Again, I'm demonstrating the process of getting acquainted with one of many tools for use in public health to illustrate how it does take some time to learn what data is available online and also to show that many of the tools online are only accessible to certain groups of users due to privacy and security concerns with using patient data. The purpose of registries is an important concept to understand. In reviewing the epidemiological databases and registries that are available, you will get a better understanding of the purpose of these tools. The types of information contained include incidence, prevalence, and other statistical data on cancer, 
mortality rates for different types of diseases or illnesses, and also exposures to toxic agents. The growing network on environmental sensor data enables public health agencies to survey and to report on different environmental contaminants. Information can then be used in different applications of epidemiological research, such as estimating survival rates, estimating risks for specific disease, and evaluating short-term and long-term effects of environmental exposures. Research to test epidemiological hypotheses can be conducted using the information contained within these registries and databases, providing potential disease etiology, as well as the potential source for participants in investigative studies to improve health for the population. A registry is one type of publicly available data source. Other publicly available data sources include notifiable disease systems and clinical systems such as electronic lab reporting. In focusing on registries, we want to understand the defining traits of a registry that can be used in research on population health. Registries typically provide information associated with disease, either a single disease or group of similar diseases, and also Registries may be associated with information on a specific grouping of environmental contaminants. The data within registries is collected from many different sources. The data is collected prospectively, which means the data collection is current and actively ongoing, with information obtained from active systems such as hospital discharge systems. Any follow-up studies using registries is done to investigate current health status of individuals with data within those registries. Lastly, registries are expensive. All of the preceding traits defined for this information tool are expensive to do. Collecting data from divergent data sources over a long period of time requires a lot of manual effort as well as technical effort the staff and technical expertise necessary to maintain these registries are expensive to maintain. Who is maintaining these registries? Well, as you saw in the previous list of epidemiological databases and registries that are publicly available, many different types of organizations are maintaining these, federal, state, and local government agencies, as well as universities, hospitals, nonprofits, and private entities, or some of the institutions collecting or reporting on health information. Here is a visual representation of the cycle of public health information exchange. These are the many components in the information flow between health institutions. Now there are many other subcomponents that we will see in the next slide, but these organizations represent the main nodes of our information network. All of these institutions are required to maintain this flow of information so that we can study and maintain the population's health. This slide shows a much more complex relationship between clinical sites, state, local, federal, public health departments, CDC, communities, state and local response teams, as well as treatment intervention centers. Due to the complex relationships in the flow of patient data between many different organizations, privacy and security of this information is a priority. As we can see in the news almost daily, the privacy and security of consumer information is an ongoing, evolving issue. With an increasing amount of information exchanged online, this is equally the case for patient data there must be a focus on maintaining privacy and security of personal health data in the collection, storage, and exchange of information that goes on electronically with patient health records. Information exchange is not done exclusively online, but potentially someone could also electronically store patient records on a zip drive and then accidentally leave that zip drive in a public location. In order to prevent such incidents, where personal health data is compromised, many federal and state laws have been enacted. However, there is variation in these laws which complicates the exchange of data between health organizations. This variation also includes differences in how these laws are interpreted and acted upon by organizations. 
Some of the variations in exchanging and accessing personal patient data include differences in how patient consent information is obtained, how users are authenticated and authorized in electronic health systems, as well as how patients are identified in multiple health systems. These are just some of the differences in how organizations interpret laws and maintain the security and privacy of personal patient data. Other units of this public health course will examine this issue more in depth. However, you should be familiar with how these issues impact the use of information tools such as public health registries and databases. Privacy and security must not become an obstacle in exchanging health information in order to study and maintain population health, but rather, health information systems must be built on mechanisms of trust so that public health information tools can continue to evolve, improve, and be adopted into the overall health system. This slide provides additional information regarding data available to public health professionals. The website links are provided on the references slide. This presentation illustrates the abundances of informational resources available to public health professionals when working to understand how a disease is impacting a community or population. Public health professionals must actively seek out information from a variety of resources, such as databases and registries, to understand population health.